today we're going to go over all of the new protocols and the way that the new protocols are set up. Um, they're now divided between adult and pediatric, so there's a lot of duplication in the pediatric protocol, so we'll be able to go through those pretty quickly. Uh, the reason why they have separate protocols for peds is because all of the medication doses, dosages are now on the protocols themselves. You're not having to flip back to another um, sheet to find out what your dosages are. So um, it makes it a lot easier to use. There's also uh, most of the protocols are now two pages. And the second page is mostly just information for you guys. Some of it is from me, some of it is from the state, and you'll see the differences in those. The protocols from the state are now um, able to be modified by each county, and that's what took us a couple of months to go through and modify. We can't modify everything without, um, uh, well, everything has to be approved by the state, but we're only supposed to modify things that are in the purple boxes. We have to get special permission to modify anything that's not in a purple box. And mostly the purple boxes are medication dos dosages, and you'll see, we'll go over that. Um, and there are some differences county to county, just so that you guys know. So this is the first page of the Universal Patient Care Protocol, and you know there's not a whole lot different on this, but um, just want to show you how the second page is um, has a, a big purple box on it where I can put any information that I want you guys to have uh, about the specific protocols. Uh, and then at the bottom of each protocol is the pearls, just like in the 2009 protocols, you've got the pearls at the bottom of the page. Now it's on the second page, and it just gives me a lot more room to give you guys some information. So, for example, on the uh, universal patient care protocol, uh, on the second page, I put a lot of information about um, what is considered a pediatric patient because it's not always clear cut. Uh, for example, the um, patients are considered pediatric if they're less than 16 years of age, unless you're talking about airways, and then it goes down to 12. So, a 12 year old is considered an adult airway. Um, that may be changing within the next year, but for right now, it's 12. Um, also, kids that are off the Braslow tape are considered adults, so um, it's just different depending on what protocol you're working on. If you're working on a cardiac protocol, then below 16 is, is pediatric. Um, if you're working on an airway protocol, which you may be doing both in the same patient, then um, uh, below 12 is considered a pediatric, which means that, the only thing that means is that you can't RSI. Uh, and there's also some information on here about patient refusal and what I would like you guys to document um, for a patient refusal. Uh, which just includes a, a set of vital signs and documenting their mental status that they have capacity and, and watching them ambulate at their baseline. So the first protocols that we're going to go through, um, it goes adult airway and then adult cardiac, and then we get into some general protocols, and then we'll do PEDS. So they're, they're grouped in sections, and you'll notice that, uh, like, for example, there's no protocol 10, and the reason why they did that is because if we want to add a protocol specific to our county that's just for us, we can add a protocol 10. So there's a couple of protocol numbers that are skipped to allow you to put one in that section so that things are grouped by section. Um, the other thing that we're going to do when we print these is have them printed where, um, since they're two pages, the first page will be on the left and the second page will be on the right so that when you open the protocol, you've got the whole protocol in front of you so you're not having to flip pages. Um, <clears throat> the information that's on the second page, is, is, a lot of them have a pretty good Im bit of information on there. That's not something that I'm expecting you to read while you're taking care of a patient. It's more for your information. Um, if you've got a question about it, then you can go to the protocol and, and look at the additional information. If you have any questions about it, you can email me and, and uh, I'll be happy to respond. So the adult airway protocol, uh, there's not a whole lot of differences on this protocol from the 2009 protocol other than the fact that you can now use CPAP for any airway problem. You don't have to limit it to pulmonary edema. So anybody that's needing supplemental oxygen um, and, and working to breathe, you can put them on CPAP. Um, definition of a failed airway is on here. It has not changed. So inability to ventilate and oxygenate. Um, anatomy that's inconsistent with innovation or three unsuccessful attempts by your most experienced paramedic. On here, and you'll, there's, there's other airway protocols that we'll get to, um, like the RSI protocol, but on here, your um, option for sedation um, is Versed. Um, and on the, um, the RSI protocol, you've got a lot more options for um, sedation. So there's some information on this second page about uh, difficult airways. This is nothing new. You guys have seen all this before, all the acronyms that you use to kind of judge whether or not you uh, suspect that an airway is going to be difficult. Um, and then the pearls from the state are at the bottom. The most important one on this one is the use of uh, in-tidal capnography. All 
All right, the adult fail failed airway protocol. Again, there's nothing really different on this one from the 2009 protocol. Um, it's got the definition of a failed airway, the option for a uh, surgical airway, uh, or the option to just use a bag valve mask if you're able to do that, um, maintaining the end title between 35 and 45. Uh, and then again, there's just information on here about uh, difficult airways. All right, this is one everybody wants to see. So the RSI protocol now does have some changes on it, primarily to the medications that you're able to use for RSI. And some of this, well, all of this we went over in our um, medication class that we did. Um, so on the protocol, and you'll notice that um, the white box that, so this is the difference between the white and the purple. The purple, I'm able to modify the white I'm not supposed to touch. Um, so if you'll notice on here, it says rocuronium if stux is contraindicated. That's from the state, so I can't change that, but I'm not going to have a problem if you guys use rock, rock versus stux because there really is no true contraindication to using rock. Uh, as we talked about in the class before, there are some patients that may benefit from one over the other, um, but if a patient needs an airway, the patient needs an airway. So there, um, there uh, I said rock, but I meant stux. There is no true contraindication to stux. Um, there are relative contraindications, um, but with that being said, if you want to use ROC, use ROC. If you, you know, may suspect hyperkalemia or, uh, you know, all the things that we talked about in the medication class, then, um, you know, feel free to use ROC. Um, and then your options for post-intubation sedation, um, you can use Versed, you can use morphine or fentanyl. And, and please notice on these protocols, uh, all of the protocols that have morphine or fentanyl, it is an or and not an and. So if you max out on your morphine, you need to call medical control for use of fentanyl. Or you could just use more morphine, but you still need to call for that. So um, you're not supposed to max out on morphine and fentanyl. It is an or. Uh, but you can use Versed and morphine, Versed and fentanyl. Um, you can also use ketamine. Uh, and the dosing is the same for sedation post-RSI as it is for the induction dose. It's 2 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and you can repeat that dose in 20 minutes if you need to. Um, can y'all see that? And then you can also use rocuronium for a um, post-RSI paralytic if you need it for transport. Um, and like we said in the class before, uh, you know, please make sure that you sedate your patients adequately. Don't just paralyze them. Um, and so just as, for example, if you intubate with, if you in, do your induction with, um, sucks, you can still use rock after that, after the intubation to paralyze for transport. Uh, and this is just different information about intubation. It's all stuff you guys have seen before. Back pain protocol. Um, so this protocol is not really different. It's one of those that is, uh, there's several protocols that are basically protocols to go to other protocols. So their complaint may be back pain, but, um, you know, if they've got any kinds of signs of shock, then, you know, you may need to go to a different airway. So, you know, hopefully nobody coming in with back pain is going to be hypotensive. But if you have a dissection, that could happen. So um, there's some information on the second page about red flags and things that can be serious um, etiologies of back pain. Uh, your high risk patients, and um, you guys can read through that whenever you have a chance. And then a little bit of pearls at the bottom. Okay, behavior protocol. So on this protocol, um, basically it's separated out, you know, get a blood sugar, obviously, um, and you may need to exit to the diabetic protocol. Um, but it's separated out between excited delirium patients and your psychiatric patients. And sometimes it's not always clear which is which. Um, sometimes their history will give you a little clue. Um, but if you suspect excited delirium, um, then Versed is your only option. Um, we're hoping to get approval for use of ketamine, but as of right now, um, that's uh, still at the state level being decided. So for right now, uh, Versed is the only thing that you have. Um, and you can give it IV, IO, IN, or IM. Uh, for patients that have a psychiatric history, um, I left Haldol on here just in case there's a national shortage of Geodon so that we have the option to carry it. I know we don't have it on the trucks right now, but um, a couple of years ago we did have a national shortage of Geodon, so that's why I left it on there. There's a lot of information on the second page about um, physical and chemical restraint. 
uh, and excited delirium. And the main thing that I want you to, to know here is that if you have to physically restrain a, a patient, you need to consider chemical restraint as well because I, I've never seen somebody calm down when you tie them down. So they usually get more upset when you tie them down and they fight against the restraints and that's when you can really get into trouble with excited delirium syndrome. And we're going to have another class specifically on excited delirium so you guys know a little bit better how to recognize it. Um, but, you know, just remember when you're considering physical restraint, please also consider chemical restraint. <laughs> Yeah, and you no longer have to call for Geodon. Yep. You can give it IV or IM now. Now, for the most part, if you've got a patient freaking out, it's probably going to be safer for you to give it IM. But, um, you know, but you can give it IV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the atomizers work great. We're going to have those. Um, we'll have the atomizers next to the Versed in the NARC box because the concentration for intranasal Versed is different. It's a 5 milligrams per 1 ml. It makes it easier to use because you're not putting 5, mil 5 mls up somebody's nose. Um, with that being said, if you don't have it on the truck, like if you run out or something, you've got, you know, a second patient that needs it, you can use the 5 for 5. Um, it's just a lot more convenient for you and a lot more tolerable to the patient to only put 1 ml up their nose. <laughs> Okay, pain control protocol. Um, the main difference on this one, uh, well, two things. Um, one is that the fentanyl dosing is much more accommodating now. So fentanyl, you can now give 50 to 75, uh, and you can repeat 25 every five minutes. And this is one thing that's going to be different from other counties that you may work in, because most counties have fentanyl every 20 minutes. Um, the reason why I did it every five, fentanyl is actually a great medication, and a lot of people think that it doesn't work because it's been underdosed in the past. Um, fentanyl is much quicker action than morphine, but it also goes away much quicker. So it didn't make a lot of sense to do morphine every five and fentanyl every 20. Um, <clears throat> so now the fentanyl dosing is a lot more um, appropriate, uh, and I think you'll find a lot better results with it. Uh, the other thing on here is that I took um, Toradol or Ketorolac off of the protocols. The reason for that is, and I know it works great for kidney stones, the problem is if you've got a, a one centimeter kidney stone that you're not going to be able to pass, then most urologists will not go in and break those up for five days after somebody's had Toradol because of the bleeding risk. So once you give somebody Toradol, I never give it in the hospital until I've seen a CT scan and I know how big their stone is um, because you're committing them to five days with that kidney stone uh, if you give them Toradol. Most of the time you can get them comfortable with morphine. Um, and then there's a lot of information on here about the drugs for pain control. Um, <clears throat> there are two scene rehab protocols. Um, one of them is for, this first one is for, for people who, um, you know, this is like for firefighters or um, like paramedics that are doing decon, things that are, are really strenuous activities. Um, the first one is for people that you think will be able to return to duty. So, um, you know, you're going to treat them for their cold stress and their heat stress. Um, give them some PO fluids, um, and there's information on the second page about um, criteria for sending people back into service. Uh, and then the second scene rehab protocol is for people who are likely going to have to be transported, um, may need IV fluids. It's got vital signs on here that um, will be able to guide you whether or not they're going to need uh, medical treatment or not. All right, so now we're going to get into the cardiac protocols. And each of these are color-coded so that you can see the grouping. So we just skipped from protocol 9 to <coughs> protocol 11. So there is no protocol 10. Protocol 11 is the asystole PEA protocol. Um, the, there's not a whole lot of differences on this from the 2009. Some of them say to go to other protocols, like for your renal failure patients, which are going to get bicarbon calcium. Um, and there is no longer um, atropine on the asystole and PEA protocol. Um, there's information on the second page about giving bicarbon calcium for your uh, renal patients. Um, and there's also inform some information about what you might um, suspect to go to the overdose toxicology protocol.
so atropine is still on the bradycardia protocol uh, and then saline and then um, the dopamine has been changed to epi and then there's also the option for Versed if you're having to pay somebody the second page has information about excuse me the different degrees of heart block and how to recognize them um, there's also information on here about uh, how to titrate your epi drips. So all of the protocols that have epi drips on them have this little table on here to make it easier to start that. The cardiac arrest protocol, there's really nothing different on here. This is one where you know you may need to exit the protocol, but it's kind of a general protocol that um, tells you to go to other protocols. Talks about an under, an under the uninterrupted compression. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that um, there is a lot of debate over right now, and all of the counties that are doing that have had very good success with it and had improvement in their survival to hospital rate um, with pit crew CPR. The biggest problem with doing it here is having the enough people to do it. Um, what I would like to do at, at some point within the next year is, is see what the feasibility is with doing that. So right now, you know, we don't have all the information that we need to make that decision. That's how I, I would like to go in the future, but it's a matter of logistically figuring out how to do that. So as of right now, we're not doing that, but um, we will be looking at that pretty closely in the near future. <clears throat> there is a protocol that's optional for pit crew CPR. Um, we haven't included it yet, but we will be looking at that. So, I don't want CPR transported emergency traffic, no. As for right now, we're still transporting CPR. Um, again, something that we're looking at, but um, yeah, it doesn't need to go emergency traffic. It's hard enough to run CPR in the back of an ambulance without being thrown all over the place, so it's not really safe, and it's you know probably not going to make a difference in the patient either. Um, I think you can probably do better CPR if you're not flying down the road. So um, the next protocol is the cardiac STEMI protocol, and this is more of a destination thing. It tells you to transmit your EKGs early to the appropriate hospital that has uh, cath lab, there's nothing different on this one. Um, nitro for uh, the chest pain and also for blood pressure. Um, fentanyl and morphine or morphine, <laughs> fentanyl or morphine um, if they need it. And then there's uh, a lot of information on here uh, about um, STEMIs. So uh, the CHF and pulmonary edema protocol. Um, this talks about whether they're mild, moderate, or whether they're in shock. Um, use of CPAP if they have moderate to severe um, nitro, and then uh, if they're in shock, exit to the hypotension protocol. Um, there's a lot of information on here about pulmonary edema, um, what causes it, how to treat it. Um, the good thing about pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure is that even though there are different etiologies for pulmonary edema, uh, it's all treated the same. So that makes it easy. So whether it's from heart failure or whether it's a consequence of uh, hypertension, hypertensive emergency, um, it's all treated the same with uh, CPAP and nitro. So the adult uh, narrow complex tachycardia protocol. So obviously anybody that's unstable gets electricity. Uh, and then it's divided into whether you have a regular rhythm or an irregular rhythm. And sometimes when you get an irregular rhythm, if it gets fast enough, it's really hard to tell if it's irregular or not. So um, both, you know, whether or not you go down the regular rhythm or the irregular rhythm uh, pathway, it's actually treated exactly the same. So they both get adenosine first. And the reason for that is that if it is SVT, it will likely convert them back to a sinus rhythm. If it's AFib, it'll slow them down enough to where you can diagnose their AFib and see what's going on. So 
Uh, both get adenosine at 6, 12, and 12, just like before. And then if that doesn't work, then they get cardizem um, or diltiazem. Uh, and then people over 60 get half dose of uh, cardizem. I don't think it has a rate on here. Oh, it is, yeah. Greater than 150. That's okay. Okay, so wide complex tachycardia. Uh, so for this one, uh, it's divided into um, regular or irregular, just like on the other one. Um, the regular complex um, is going to get adenosine, and the reason for that is that it's really difficult to tell VTAC from SVT with aberrancy. And SVT with aberrancy is somebody who has a pre-existing bundle branch block, so they're already wide at baseline, and then they become tachycardic. So you get a wide complex tachycardia, even though they're in SVT, they were wide to begin with, so you can't tell the difference between somebody who goes into SVT who already is wide from somebody who's in VTAC. It looks exactly the same. So they get adenosine, again, because if they're in SVT with aberrancy, then it's going to hopefully convert them to sinus rhythm. If it doesn't, then you give them amiodarone um, for VTAC and electricity if they are unstable. And then the irregular gets cardioverted uh, and mag if they need it. All right, pulseless VTAC and VFib. Uh, I think the only difference in this one from the 2009 is the amiodarone addition. I did leave lidocaine on the protocol as an option. Um, so if they get amio and they convert, then put them on an amio drip. If they don't, then go to lidocaine. And if they convert on lidocaine, then put them on a lidocaine drip. So put them on, on, on whatever drip um, medication works for them. Uh, there's some additional information on here about dialysis patients, about the use of mag, and there's also instructions at the very bottom about how to mix your amio drip. The post-resuscitation protocol, the dopamine's been changed to epi. Um, if you do have to innovate, which most of the time you will, whether it's with a king or with a ET tube, they can get Versed and fentanyl or morphine, which is on the second page. I just didn't have enough room in this box to put the fentanyl or morphine, but pretty much any time you can get fentanyl, you can get morphine and vice versa. Um, or you can actually use ketamine for this one as well. So, um, And then uh, you can also use rock on this one for uh, transport, for paralysis for transport. And then there's some information on here about... Um, sedation for transport, and then the epi drip table is on here as well. Um, also couldn't fit the redosing of ketamine on the second page, so the, uh, or on the first page, so that's here on the second page as well. All right, this is a new one. So induced hypothermia, and what we're going to do is we're going to have two bags of cold saline on the truck, uh, and you'll also have ice packs. Six, you'll need six ice packs if you're going to cool somebody, so um, one on each carotid, which is really the most important because you want to, the cooling doesn't do anything for the heart, it protects the brain, so your long-term outcomes from cooling are much better um, for neurologic function. Uh, so um, two on each carotid, two in the axilla, two in the groin. Um, and you know, I would say if you've got a patient that you're um, doing CPR on, it's, there's no harm in starting the cold saline. Um, because if you get them back, you've already got the cold sailing going, so that's certainly an option. So sedation, if you do get return of spontaneous circulation for a patient that you're going to cool, is really important because if they're shivering, then they're increasing their metabolic needs and they're going to develop a lactic acidosis. So you want to make sure that you're giving them adequate sedation, and if you can't get them to sh stop shivering, give them uh, a paralytic um, to keep them from shivering. Same thing on this protocol. Couldn't fit the morphine on the sec or on the first page, so it's on the second page. 
But like I said, anytime you give fentanyl, you can give morphine. Yeah, if, only if you need to keep them down. Now, you know, with that being said, oh, let me go back to the, um, so the, oops, that's not the right one. The criteria for cooling somebody, they have to be pretty out of it already. Like, they can't be responding to painful stimuli. Um, they can't have any presence of, um, like, purposeful movement. So they, and you can do this for any rhythm now. It used to be that you could only cool somebody that had a V-fib arrest. Um, but now you can do this for any presenting rhythm. Um, they have to have an airway in place. They can't have any purposeful movement. It can't be a traumatic arrest, and they can't already be hypothermic. Uh, the other thing on this protocol is that the first page calls for rectal thermometers. I've already talked to the state about that, and they said that we can remove that requirement. So we can just use the, um, the temporal. Okay, so the abdominal pain protocol has on here where you can give some saline. If they're hypotensive, you can give Zofran or Phenergan. Um, I think we talked about this before, that uh, the reason why we're only doing IM Phenergan is because of the risk of tissue necrosis. If you have an infiltration of Phenergan sub-Q, it causes tissue necrosis. Um, it doesn't do that when you give it IM. Uh, and I actually saw a lady recently that came into Lexington that had had that, and it looked like a big chunk had been taken out of her AC, so it was all scarred down. She couldn't extend her elbow all the way, and we couldn't get an IV on that side because it was just completely scarred down. So, um, And now that we have the option of, of uh, Zofran ODT, then uh, you may not even have to get an IV. The allergic reaction protocol, uh, there's really no difference on this one um, as the one before. It's just, uh, you know, for mild, they get Benadryl, moderate, you add, um, possibly add Epi and Albuterol, and then um, severe, uh, same thing, they may get some saline for some hypotension, and then um, Solumedrol at the bottom. There's a lot of information on the second page for you guys um, about anaphylaxis. Um, one thing that is important to recognize is that you don't have to have hives to have anaphylaxis. So there's a list of symptoms that are pretty typical with uh, anaphylaxis on here. And any two symptoms, if you have one symptom from two different categories, that gets you anaphylaxis. Um, so they need epi. So sometimes patients just come in with dizziness and abdominal pain um, from their anaphylaxis. So it's really easy to kind of miss that if, if you don't get the right story of, you know, I ate shrimp for dinner and now I feel terrible. Okay, alter mental status. This is another protocol that tells you to exit to different protocols depending on what's going on. So checking blood sugar, checking blood pressure. Um, any history of, of overdose, um, doing a stroke screen, um, and then EKG. So this is a, kind of a protocol to other protocols. And then there's some information on the second page for you. And there's really no big difference on this protocol from the old protocol, other than that you can get CPAP. Um, or any kind of airway compromise. <coughs> the um, diabetic protocol is just divide, divided into low blood sugar and high blood sugar. The biggest difference on this protocol from the 2009 is that the blood sugar limit has been changed for giving oral glucose. It used to be less than 60, and now it's less than 70. So if they're less than 70 and symptomatic, then you can give oral glucose. 
and then option for D50 if they're not able to tolerate oral. Um, there's some information on the second page about um, insulin pumps. The With insulin pumps, um, probably the easiest way to manage those is to get a family member to turn them off. Um, it's not always obvious how to do that, but you don't necessarily have to remove the needle that they have. Those needles are, they change them every three days, but if you don't have to remove the needle, then they would probably appreciate that. Um, and there's uh, additional information on here about DKA, why it's so important to get fluids. And, um, also some information about patient refusal, which is a really common thing for a patient to get treatment and then refuse transport, which is perfectly okay. Um, one thing that I would caution against is patients who are just on oral agents. Um, with the exception of metformin, uh, oral agents can be pretty long-acting and, and cause rebound hypoglycemia. So definitely encourage them to eat something. Um, if they don't want to go to the hospital, uh, please encourage them to see their doctor within the next 24 hours. A lot of times with um, diabetic patients, when they are hypoglycemic, it's because there's something else going on as well. Same thing with hyperglycemia. Things like urinary tract infections and stuff like that can cause that. So um, this is the dialysis protocol. Um, there is a separate protocol on dealing with, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the um, central line. So if they have a, a shunt that's bleeding, you can just apply direct pressure. But there is a separate protocol on dealing with central lines like um, bath caps and, and dialysis catheters. Uh, and then if they have pulmonary edema, you can go to that protocol, um, put them on CPAP, that kind of thing. Um, for codes, they get calcium chloride and bicarb. Or even if they just have, um, signs of um, hyperkalemia like heat T waves on EKG, you can give them calcium and bicarb before they actually code. You don't have to call for that. Um, there's a lot of information on here about dialysis. Um, a lot of patients give themselves dialysis at home and they can have problems with that. They can get infections um, in their abdomen from that. Uh, there's information on hemodialysis, uh, how to treat shunt bleeding. Um, typical complications of dialysis treatment, which is usually hypertension, um, and then how to deal with their uh, indwelling lines. You can access um, central lines in a code situation. Um, it's really the only reason why we mess with dialysis catheters or central lines is in a code. Uh, the reason for that, well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, they've got heparin in those lines, so if you don't draw the heparin out, then you're flushing all that heparin into the patient. And two, if you don't reflush it with heparin after you're done with it, then they clot off and they have to be, you know, completely taken out and replaced. So um, even in the hospital, we don't mess with lines or with dialysis lines or central lines that are, you know, placed uh, for people to use outside the hospital unless it's a code situation. Okay, hypertension protocol. Um, there's a lot of information in this red box about treating hypertension. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me about, you know, should we treat hypertension and people that we suspect may have a spontaneous head bleed? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, we don't want to bottom out their blood pressure, so you really want to do, reduce them by about 20%. Um, but you do want to reduce it because the um, increased pressure is why they're bleeding. Um, but you don't want to decrease their pressure so much that they're not going to perfuse their brain. So. You don't want to drop them back to normal. You just want to reduce it a little bit. And there, um, nitro is the only option for that. The shock protocol um, divides the different types of shock. They're pretty much all treated the same with the exception of cardiogenic shock, which gets half of the um, bolus and, and may need epi. Um, well, they all get epi, but... Um, so hypovolemic shock is going to be like your um, blood loss or um, severe um, dehydration. Cardiogenic is just where your heart is not pumping like it should. That's usually post-MI. Um, it can also be because of toxins, um, and you can get that um, post, um, postpartum cardiogenic shock. Um, distributive shock is like your sepsis where 
you know, you've got all of these um, chemicals that are produced from the bacteria and that are produced by your body that cause your uh, blood vessels to dilate, so you get all the all your blood just kind of gets distributed in your um, periphery, and you don't have it centrally, so that's why they definitely need epi. And then obstructive shock is like your um, cardiac tamponade, your um, tension pneumothorax, things that obstruct the outflow of the heart. And then the second page um, has your epi drip on here. So overdose and toxins. Um, so Narcan titrated for respiratory, not for consciousness. Um, I know I've seen a lot of people give like one milligram of Narcan. We usually start with 0.4 in the hospital. You can always give more. You can give up to two milligrams, but it's really not safe for the patient or for you know whoever's in the back of the ambulance with them for them to wake up screaming and fighting and then you know you're. It's not like you can put it. So it has information about specific overdoses on here. Beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. Um, both of those get glucagon and calcium. Epi if you need it. Um, TCAs get bicarb and more bicarb and lots of bicarb. Um, we don't carry the uh, two PAM injectors. Um, so not a lot you can do for organophosphates. You can give us some atropine. Um, on the second page, there's a lot of information on the second page. So the most important thing with ingestions is the time of the ingestion, especially with Tylenol ingestions. We have to, The way that we manage Tylenol ingestions in the hospitals, we have to get a four-hour level. So whatever their Tylenol level is four hours after they took it is how we manage care. Um, and so it's really important, if you can, to get an accurate time of onset. Um, the other thing with ingestions is that most of the time they're not just one thing that, you know, people will take everything that they've got, you know, available. So, um, you know, if you can grab pill bottles, that kind of thing, it helps. There's a list of medications on here that is absorbed by charcoal and is not absorbed by charcoal. Um, so that can definitely be helpful in deciding whether to give it. The other thing that's really, really important with these overdoses is the contact poison control, and you can do that from the scene. The reason why it's important to do that from the scene is a couple of things. They can help with decision on whether to give charcoal or not. The other thing is that they may change your destination because if it's one of these that's not absorbed by charcoal, like for example lithium, the only way to get rid of lithium is dialysis. And so it may change where you take the patient because you certainly wouldn't take them to Lexington or any of these other smaller hospitals that can't do inpatient dialysis. Um, so it you know, they can give you that information pretty quickly over the phone, so it may change your, your destination. Uh, it also helps us because we get a heads up before you guys even get there on, you know, what the ingestion is and how to treat it. Um, beta blocker and calcium channel blockers. There's a list of common beta blockers and calcium channel blockers on here to, to help know, you know, when to give the glucagon uh, and calcium. They change pretty regularly, but these are the most common. Uh, there's also a list of TCAs on here, and uh, there's some things that you can look for in EKG changes uh, that might indicate a TCA overdose. All right, the seizure protocol. So um, you can give Versed or Valium for seizure. You can give it IO, I, or IV, IO, IN, or IM uh, for um, Versed, and then you can also give it PR for uh, Valium. Um, there is a separate protocol for pregnant patients, and on that protocol, it specifically says to give the um, Versed first, or give the benzo first, and then go to magnesium. Um, it's just in a little box down here on this protocol, uh, but there there is a, a pregnant protocol, so just remember you give benzos first. Uh, there's a lot of information on here about the different types of seizure. Um, I know we see some pretty interesting ones sometimes that are uh, pseudo seizures, but there are some um, partial seizure seizures that can have some pretty interesting uh, findings as well. So I've talked about that, and then the it has the intranasal dose of of Versed on here. The suspected stroke protocol. Um, again, time of onset is is probably the most important thing to to know for a stroke patient. Um, 
that's not always easy for us to get once we get to the hospital because family members don't always come immediately. So the more information you can get about when the patient was last known to be normal, um, not when they were discovered with their stroke symptoms is, is really important. Um, and then there uh, is um, the nitro dosing on here for blood pressure reduction for suspected stroke, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, you can still use nitro. And then there's a lot of information on here about stroke. Um, so one thing with strokes now that we're going to start doing is doing blood draws. Um, the reason why we stopped doing that is because half the time they got thrown away because the hospitals couldn't come to a consensus on what tubes to use. And so Baptist and Novant got together and decided that they would come up with one packet that everybody was happy with. Um, let me just pass that around. Uh, so these packets are available at all the Forsyth hospitals and Baptist hospitals, and you can just go in and um, grab them from the bin. We're also going to keep them stocked on this truck. Uh, it has everything that you need in there, with the exception, I don't think there's an alcohol swab in there, but you've got this. Um, if you want to use the angio cast on the truck, that's fine. There's one in there, I think it's a 20 gauge. You don't have to use the one that's in there. Um, it is a valve um, angio cast. Uh, the tubes that are in there are um, different colors, and on the outside of the packet, is it tells you what order to draw them in. The reason that's important is because some of the tubes have stuff in them, like the blue tube has heparin in it, and so it can actually change your um, results if you don't take the if you don't draw them in the right order. But it's got the little um, adapter in there for the vacutainers, so you don't have to draw the blood up into a syringe and then put it in the vacutainers. You just hook the little adapter up, and the uh, vacutainers get plugged in directly to that little adapter. Um, and then you just take that off and flush it like you would normally. So you don't have to put it into a syringe because that, that causes hemolysis when you have to do that. Um, the only hospital that we haven't heard from yet, um, we checked with High Point because they're a, a um, Carolina. Um, Chapel Hill, you know, is over them. So we're checking with them to see if they can take these kits. Um, but every other hospital is either affiliated with Baptist or um, Novant. So... Um, they're compatible with everybody else. The syncope protocol, again, this is one that exits to other protocols. And then there's some information on the second page about syncope and who's considered high risk. Vomiting and diarrhea, um, again, you've got the Zofran or Finergan option and then you may have to exit to other protocols depending on what's going on. Okay. So the childbirth protocol, hopefully hopefully no one will have to use this, but it talks about the different complications that you can have with um, childbirth. Um, the prolapse cord and shul shoulder dystocia and breech birth are, are the scary things. Um, it's got information on here how to treat that. Um, and then on the second page, it's got the stages of labor um, and then more information about complications and what to do with those. The newborn protocol, the only difference with this one is that it's no longer indicated to do routine suctioning of the airway. So you don't have to suction the airway when the baby's head comes out. You don't have to suction the airway at all if the baby is doing okay. Uh, if the baby's, you know, crying, breathing, um, and looks good, then you don't have to suction at all. You can still do deep suctioning for meconium aspiration. Um, and then it's got things on here for if the baby's not doing well. Um, exit to the PEDS cardiac protocol if, uh, if need be. If, there, if the heart rate is less than 60, um, then they need chest compression. The obstetric emergency protocol is more for not patients that are in labor, but patients that are just pregnant and have emergencies. Um, if they're seizing, then uh, they get Versed or, or uh, Valium first and then go to MAG. If they're hypotensive, then they get saline. The second page has a lot of information on here about obstetric emergencies. So ectopic pregnancies, which people do die from, um, and then placental abruption and placental placenta previa, those complications are more dangerous for the baby than the mother. Um, Preeclampsia is dangerous for the mother. Uterine rupture is dangerous for everybody. Um, so placental abruption is where the placenta inappropriately separates from the wall of the uterus early, and so you get 
um, bleeding in between the placenta and the, the uterus. It doesn't always come out. So you can have abruption with no bleeding whatsoever. You always have pain with it. So abruptions <coughs> always hurt, but they don't always bleed. It's the opposite with previa. So placenta previa is where the placenta is over the cervical opening. So you, the baby can't come out because the placenta is blocking the exit. So when the cervix starts to dilate, it starts to pull, and you get bleeding from that. So with previa, you always get bleeding, but you don't always get pain. So this is a patient who's in their third trimester and has vaginal bleeding. They may or may not have pain, but this is an emergency. What they usually do with these patients is that they do C-sections early at like 35 weeks, hoping that they don't go into labor, but they may go, you know, early, um, into early labor and have some bleeding from that. That is definitely a obstetric emergency. Um, preeclampsia is the, what leads up to eclampsia, which is seizing in pregnancy. Um, preeclampsia is, um, something that patients usually know that they have. They have high blood pressure, they have protein in their urine, they have liver enzyme problems. Um, and that's something that's screened for if they have prenatal care. So they usually know if they have that. Um, and then uterine rupture is typically from either trauma or patients that have had previous C-sections, especially emergency C-sections in the past, they can have um, uterine rupture. Uh, the, um, the predisposing fact factors for placental abruption are hypertension, um, and cocaine use. The burn protocol, there's really nothing different on this protocol from before. Uh, the important thing to remember here is that you only count second and third degree burns when you're talking about total body surface area burns, so if it doesn't blister, you don't count it. The um, formula on here for giving fluids, this is a modified Parkland formula. Um, I changed the way that the state wrote this because it was very confusing. You'll see it on the PEDS protocol because I forgot to change it on that one. I'm going to go back and change it to what, the way this looks. But it's 0.25 times their weight in kilograms times their total body surface area um, that's burned. So there's an example here at the bottom where if you have an 80 kilogram person, so it's 0.25 times 80 times 50% is their total body surface area. So that gives you a liter that's given per hour. Adult head trauma protocol, um, there's really nothing different on this one either. This is um, the hyperventilation. This is one where I changed what the state had, um, even though it wasn't purple, because they had, on one side, they had do not hyperventilate, and on the other side, they had hyperventilate, and it didn't make any sense. So it's you do not hyperventilate unless they have signs of herniation. So if they have a blown pupil, um, if they're posturing, then you do hyperventilate to an end tidal of 30 to 35. Um, still innovation for GCS of 8 or less. Um, 
On the second page, the, there is a PEDS head trauma protocol, but there's no second page to it. So I put a lot of information on here that also applies to PEDS about concussions. Uh, and this is a really, really hot topic and has been for several years now, uh, especially in pediatric athletes. But there's a, this is like a list of um, common things that you'll see with concussions. These kids absolutely need to be seen for several reasons. One is because it's a requirement now that student athletes who have a concussion get reported to the state. So we have to fill out a form just like we do with dog bites. Um, the other thing is that these kids need to be followed because they can have symptoms for weeks to months after a concussion and they really can't return to um, any kind of sport that has con any kind of contact sport until they're completely symptom free because that's when you see the really bad outcomes with um, head injuries. Um, most hospitals now have clinics that specifically follow these kids. They have concussion clinics. Uh, and that's really important because you know it, it's important for them to be seen until they're symptom free so that you know they don't they're not playing sports. So the other thing is that a lot of times these kids need no, needs no, can't talk today need notes for school because they may need like extra time for work and they may need to um, have shorter school days and that kind of thing until their um, concussion symptoms go away. The multiple trauma protocol, this is, again, more of a, tra uh, you know, where to take the patient, um, blunting if necessary. There's nothing different.